Hello, my fellow YouTubers. This is Roy back again. On my last video I made, um, I talked about a book in every home from Ed Lee Scallon. And I also talked about um, scalar waves. And tonight I wanted to continue the, uh, show you a couple experiments and continue the, um, the next chapter for my video that I previously made. And we'll get into a couple things here which are pretty interesting. So let's go ahead and plug in the oscilloscope. Turn this fan off. Okay, fans off. And let's dive right into it. All right, so I'll saw scopes on. And as I turn, you'll see that there's a push and pull me wave being created by the wheel. Okay. And that's because of the reaction that's coming off this one PMH. And that PMH is hooked up to the oscilloscope. I'm sort of checking its frequency, its uh, wave. And there's a load on that. So you can see that the tops are not perfect sideways they got some some pointing pointiness to them so this PMH here is going to produce a scalar wave and we're gonna ask yourself how are we gonna do this well right here I got two speakers hooked up now what we're gonna do is I got this speaker tapped into wherever the oscilloscope is touching, the two wires, and it's hooked up to the positive and negative of, of its polarity set up in the back there, okay? And then this one here is hooked up to the opposite. So on its plus going in, I got the negative, and so that's basically taking these two speakers and putting them out of phase. Now, a couple things I want you to see. It's pretty exciting. Here I got some sugar. I'm doing some uh, vibration frequencies with this, and we'll get into that in another video. Right now, I want to cover. So, this speaker is connected in there in, in one phase, and this is the other phase. So, they're opposite phases. So, in retrospect, if I turn the wheel... This one should be going up and this one should be going down, okay? Now, if we were to take these and put them towards each other, it's a whole nother video um, in talking about uh, what do you put inside and what frequency you throw in there. But we'll get into this a little bit more detailed. But right now, I'm gonna show you something fascinating. If I touch this, watch that light. Okay, so we're putting a charge back into the PMH. There's starters. Why don't you guys look at this as a figure eight? Okay, a figure eight. Two circles put together, and there it's a figure eight. This is the backbone of the demonstrations and the video tonight that I'm making. So you see when I touch this, bright light. Okay, now when I touch this also, watch this speaker. Can't see it, so that's why I got the sugar. So there's some sugar in there. Watch the sugar, I'm gonna beat on this. So when this is being pushed, that's been, it's reacting. It's the opposite reacting. And same thing over here. If I take the sugar and put it over here, I touch this side. You see the sugar bouncing. And that's just the fun part of it. 
imagine the experiments that can go on here. This is scalar waves. Now, sound waves are compression waves. Scalar waves are compression waves. That's what they have in common. But it gets a little better. So let me come over here, grab a couple of my notes, and we'll come over here and we'll talk about this. So scalar waves are different from conventional electromagnetic transverse waves. By having two oscillations anti-parallel with each other, each originating from opposite charge sources, thereby lacking any net directional direction, directional ility, directional T, something like that. My notes are hard to read. Directional, directional T. The waves are con, the, the waves congregates of each other. And so if left uninterrupted, each pass through ordinary matter with relative ease. So they are not included in the mainstream physics. They don't work like ordinary longitudinal waves either. You can make scalar waves with a bifire filer coil, one wound with a pair of wires instead of a single wire and pushing and opposing currents through the wire Join at the end together, and it'll be a great experiment with that kind of stuff. The next part of the scalar waves we need to talk about, they are produced when two electromagnetic waves are the same frequency, are exactly of opposite to each other. The result is not exactly an In inhalation of magnetic fields, but transformation of energy back into scalar waves. This scalar waves combine or can be created by wrapping electric wires around a figure eight in the same shape of Mobius coil. When electric currents flows through the wires in opposite direction, the opposing electromagnetic field from the two wires cancel each other out and create a scalar wave. The DNA antenna in our cells, in our body, energy production centers the mitochondria, assumes the shape of what is called a supercoil. Supercoils in DNA look like a series of Mobi coils, Mobius coils. These Mobius supercoils DNA are hypolynthetically able to generate scalar waves. Most cells in our body contain thousands of these Mobius supercoils. Very important to follow up with that. Sorry about read i got the dog in the back there he's kind of distracting me but we're going to work through ed in making scalar waves and with the scalar waves we'll use the same frequency we'll come at each other ed talks about uh frequencies and we're going to have to end the video with this i left Two more notes. And these notes kind of were dug up that is very related to what, what we're talking about. Electromagnetic spectrum radiation, quarter wave resonator. Second, dairy coil wire must be a quarter wave length of the resonant frequency. Important information here. Quarter wave resonator, tube closed at one end and open at the other. The walls are rigid and of the tube 
confines a body of air within the resonator cavity under certain conditions this body of air can be brought to a state of residence octave perfect octave is an interval between one musical pitch and another with double its frequency so let's think about that scalar wave and where it fits in an octave schumann when converted into sound waves 7.83 is a flat BZ, two octaves below the lowest note on a piano. The electric powers of the electric powers hums at 60 hertz, the ninth overtone of the earth, and the loudest note from space B1 or deep B. The Earth behaves like a gigantic electric circuit. Its electromagnetic field surrounds and protects all living things with a natural pulsation of 7.83 hertz. On average, the so-called Schumann resonance. Ooh, these are my notes here. Schumann resonance. So this is the one where was, that's that one, the Schumann resonance. Earth circumference, 24,901 miles. One mile is 5,280 feet. Why is this important? Just take it on and you'll figure it out. At any given moment, about 2,000 thunderstorms roll around the Earth, all over the Earth, producing some 50 flashes of lightning every second. Each lightning burst creates electromagnetic wave that begin to circle around the Earth's captured between Earth's surface and the boundary about 60 miles up. Some of the waves, if they have just the right wavelength, combine increasing in strength to create a repeating astrophoric heartbeat known as the Schumann Resonance. This residence provides a useful tool to analyze Earth's weather, its electric environment, and to even help determine what types of atoms and molecules exist in the Earth's atmosphere. The waves created by lightning do not look like the up and down waves of the ocean, but they still oscillate with regions of greater and lesser energy. These waves remain true trapped inside the atmospheric ceiling created by the lower edge of the ionosphere, a part of the ionosphere filled with charged particles which begin at 60 miles up into the sky. In this, in this case, the sweet spot for residence requires the wave to be as long or twice, three times as long as the circumference of the Earth. Then here comes into the scalar part that we were talking about with Ed Lee Scallon and with speakers and showing a demonstration on opposite poles in the same frequency. We'll get into what we can do with that. This is extremely low frequency wave that can be as low as 8 hertz, some 100 thousand times lower than the lowest frequency of radio waves used to send signals to your am fm at this wave flows around the earth it hits itself again at the perfect spots such as the crest and troughs are aligned viva waves acting in resonance with each other to pump up a original signal the overtone series starting string vib vibrates equals 110 hertz. When you pluck a string, it vibrates many different frequencies at the same time, the lowest of which is 110 hertz fundamental frequency. So the first one here is your 110 fundamental first harmonic. The second one is your first overtone at 220. Your third one uh, your 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 second o first overtone. Your second overtone is 330. And you can see the nodes, three nodes. 
But then you can see your third overtone is 440. And you can see from the start to finish, there's two, four, six points. So that means there's one, two, three, four nodes and you're ending back again. Interesting stuff that we need to follow that comes along with working with Tesla scale of waves, our human body, and also Ed Lee Scallon's part of how he possibly levitated the rocks because we already know that scalar waves are able to punch through most or all matter. And that means all we need to do from there is a lot more work because once you have that figured out and if you wanted to levitate something or melt something, we always can melt something, but I'm gonna take rock, organic, and say, have it weightless. I would need to know the resonant frequency somehow of the material itself. And then I don't believe that that frequency is the frequency you're using. You're using a harmonic or an overtone of that frequency in order to find the place to where it could bounce back and forth and eliminate the weight of that object. Leave your comments. Hopefully you appreciate the video. You can see as I turn the wheel fast, we're gonna see the light lights up. And then these are moving fast. This is moving fast where you can barely even see it. It's moving, it's humming so fast because the wheel's turning. That's why I was bringing up the Schumann resonance. I believe the wheel doesn't have to turn fast. I feel this vibrating really good as the wheel slows down. And with the lower speeds, you're able to have more amplification. With the amplification going into a, a scalar wave, you're able to have some amplification to start the process, but I just think it's easier than that and you don't need a bunch of power. And, and then you're going to allow that wave to collapse in the center of itself and then expand. So your contraction is in the center, like our DNA, and basically you're gonna expand. And this is what we're gonna run through with Ed's wheel. We'll bring on other components to Ed's wheel with the two uh, capacitors, the condensers that he has on top of the pipe. We'll introduce ground into the system. And with the scaler, uh, I explained to you, it's not like longitudinal waves at all. Um, it's similar until it uh, opposes back into itself and creates the figure eight speedway. And in reference to that, with Ed's wheel or with Ed's PMH, going into another PMH, creates the figure eight that I speak about, but I didn't, this is not this video. We're gonna do this in another video. So with opposing coils, you're creating, you would think it cancel itself. So like all the physicists and the electrical engineers say it just cancels itself, it's, it's useless, but no. It's actually creating a, scale, a scalar wave at that point. And at that point, it's punching through everything. And at that point, punch it through everything. Just because you can't see it, that doesn't mean it's not there. And, and from that point, you come off the PMHs. And I just wanted to show on the speakers how it reacts. And you can see it just from a magnetic field going into the PMH, causing the speaker to go up and down. And then this speaker, how it's hooked up is opposing without amperage. Like if I took this and hooked it up to a 12-volt battery to a... Um, transistor 2NO3055, uh, no, uh, 2N305 uh, transistor. I think I got that right. These guys. And it's been a while since I've been in here. But a uh, 2N3055, yeah, I'm close. And you, an amplifier, you would see these bouncing out of their skin 
And from that point, we could do some other experiments, especially by search and frequency patterns. Pretty cool stuff. And then introducing the cones because the cones become antennas. So if we were to go into some of Ed's stories, not his stories, but about Ed, on how he used the cones to lift the rocks onto the loading truck to move from one location to another. We like to take the theory of what I'm laying out here and put it to work and see what we can do. Because if we're using scalar waves to penetrate objects, we already can use a frequency to melt metal. We already can use a frequency to um, allow something to heat up. But what that to me is only the first or the second layer of the onion. The third layer is the scalar part, the part to where you take uh, ethereal pressure or you take air pressure, which is sound waves, and you are dabbling in that one area and then on top of that you're going in behind the scenes behind the curtain on the whole onion where the scalar waves is penetrating everything through the whole thing basically it's the energy of the whole universe i want you guys to leave your comments peace out it's great to be back it's great to care it's great to investigate. It's great to have intuitive thoughts. And it's awesome, awesome to even care about it because you can lose your, your sting, your passion. And it happens. And I've talked a lot about that in Ed Lee Scallon's A Book in Every Home, how he talks about everything gets dull. And I don't want you guys to get dull. Even if you have to walk out of your shop for a minute, do something different. Do something against what you do normally is what I did. And I had no reason why I'm doing it, but yeah. And basically the part I still have that I'm on sabbatical is that the lifestyle change continued. And now I realize that as you go through your journey, everybody has a cross to bear. How uh, you bear it is up to you, and what you do with it is also up to you. And you can take that every day, every second that you are conscious, and look at that as a magnetic strip on your credit card, if you got one. And it just keeps acquiring. And my sabbatical was nothing more than a shaking of the tablecloth and hoping that everything on the table stayed put. And I pulled out the sheet. And by pulling out the sheet, I literally mean gave up sugar, gave up drinking, gave up whatever else, gave up um, coffee, just stripped down started exercising started running started taking control and by stripping down for three months i come to realize that it's nice to live but it's also nice to live to be able to shake off what life has has done to yourself and if it's like ed talks about um leaving a stain or more so imposing and leaving thoughts or memories or damage or illness, it uh, builds up. So I just want to say I love you all. And uh, it's tough times right now. Hopefully everybody's doing okay. And if it's not affecting you, good for you. If it is affecting you, you just stay strong. Go inside, change it, make it happen. Visualize it, jump out of the box. And that's what I did figure out is about control because all those things that stuck to me, 
pretty much stayed there on top of the new stuff coming in. And eventually it's hard to manage as a human being. And uh, you need to be able to shake off these things. And uh, by shaking them off, uh, best thing you can do um, is what's good for you. Uh, what was good for me was stopping them, whether I was consuming or whatever, and changing my physical part of myself and uh, being regimented. Uh, by doing so, you can start um, including things that you gave up, but you have to be in control of them and you can't be doing them uh, like the old timers would say to us, just do it in moderation, it's not that bad for you. But even milk is bad for you, for some people. Anyway, love you all, stay safe, take care of yourself. Peace out. Hello, my fellow YouTubers. This is Roy back again. Exciting stuff tonight. Tonight we're gonna work with longitudinal waves and uh, we're dealing tonight with um, basically sound waves, which are longitudinal waves. Uh, they have the um, same characteristics. So, we're going to deal with sound waves tonight for all my amplifier friends out there. And what we have set up here is we've got edge wheel. I guess we might as well click on the oscilloscope, which is hooked up to that PMH. So the PMH is the pickup. we got the wheel, north-south. Uh, the yellow are south, the, the dark are north. And this is Ed Lee Scallon's wheel. We're coming, this is what we're doing. So this will show uh, a heartbeat to the PMH. The PMH has a LED in between the uh, out parts of each one of these coils. The start of each one of these coils wound opposite way to create a north and south. So when this magnet here approaches this iron, or just say when it approaches this iron, this is a south pole, it makes this a north pole. Now the magnets that run through this iron core at this time are charging with, um, with uh, south, so north, they're charging with north um, pole magnets. And as this one starts to go past the metal, it, gets to a point where it stretches and then snaps and it creates a whip. There's a rate of change in a whip. So when this was north in the beginning, because it's the opposite pole, because this pole coming up will create the opposite pole in the iron, just naturally, that's the way it works. And then it will move away and then it will snap. And then this side here, the two ends of the coil, it'll have a one way, uh, whipping snap then another way whip and snap so there's a rate of change in the middle so with this coil what's going on with this coil so when this coil comes up here and charges this coil well this side which is the negative is putting positive side over here on this side and then the ends of this coil which is wound for it to be naturally uh, one pole and this the other pole when they are in their natural position so if this was wound, uh, which is, let me see, look at this. This is wound clockwise. So this, this should be a north pole, and this should be your south pole. So when this north is approaching this south, this is at its natural pole. And when it comes by both of these magnets, this is gonna stretch out, this is stretching out. While this is stretching out, that's stretching out. And what I mean stretching out, is stretching out not only the magnetic flux, but that it's making like, a contact stretch out and then all of a sudden over here and then it snaps and when it snaps it has this to go to and this takes over so that means on this side now it goes back the opposite way so when you look at these two coils they're set up to where the two uh, starts are together here and then on the two ends I have an LED set up in a certain particular way to where it's going to light the LED now, not only will it light the LED, because if I do this experiment without the LED, the experiment doesn't work. So with the LED in, in place, 
it allows a load to be put on. Not only, listen, the first major load is that in front of these magnets, when they come up on the metal, that's a that's a dead drop load. There, there's no if, ands, or buts. You got metal to magnet, and it's gonna suck everything it has. It'll suck the chrome off a trailer hitch. It is iron, it is beautiful stuff. When they say when the sun is at its end of its lifetime, the center of it turns to solid core iron, and then there's a neutron star, and when the neutron star is created, the iron blasts out and it sends iron out into the whole enchilada of the ether, and all it gets is dose of iron. And I'm sure iron, since it's super iron, that pretty much it attracts everything, and then it somewhat forms a late, formulates a rock like we have on this planet which has uh, 65 minerals, 67 minerals, and probably stuff we don't even know about. Anyway, so on the opposite end of these wires, you have the LED. The LED is gonna light, but it's a load, okay? So we're taking from the magnetism and we're dispersing it. This is a, a three volt uh, point zero five, I believe, um, load. So that's on there, but it has to be there. And we're coming out of that and going into the speaker. Now this speaker is hooked up to where the positive is on the positive side, the negative is on the negative side. So every time we turn the wheel, we're gonna get a push and pull reaction, but we're gonna get a sound wave as well. This over here is hooked up to the PMH all by itself. I got the magnet stuck to the PMH in front, so it continues a circle around, but it also has the, the, the speaker in the front. We're gonna talk about different uses that we can use this. Uh, this is really not important in regards to the wheel turning. This is a whole separate circuit. You got the wheel, make and break, the stretchy medui. You got your coils, which are um, in, in, in the way of what's happening in the iron, but the iron will release that in a way in energy into the coils, out the coils, make the light light, also make the speaker vibrate. When that speaker vibrates, we will pick up, um, we'll pick up stuff over here. Over here, I have the this setup to where it's also uh, starts are together and the ends are together, and it comes out there and goes into the uh, voltmeter, and then out of the speaker comes exactly to the voltmeter. So there's my conjunction, which this one's is not connected, so you got to get that in there. Um, pretty much, we're picking up a sound wave. This is a longitudinal wave. We're picking up, we're creating a sound wave through electromagnetic into a sound wave. We're using the sound wave because every yin on here, this is out of phase. Oh, by the way, here is hooked up on the opposite poles. So this is out of phase from this. Even though this is not hooked up to this system, which out of phase meaning if I hook this up to here, when this is yin and this is yang, -ing. when this is yang and this is yin, -ing. meaning when it's up, this is down, when it's down, this is up. It's doing now wirelessly. And this is the cool part that I wanna bring in an effect with Ed's black box. Leave your comments, guys. I know you guys love Ed Lee Scallon and so do I. So this is where it comes in with the black box. So this is just a sound wave, a percussion wave, also due to pressure, and, and, and mitigation in the pressure, this is what you get. But I'm only bringing you up to the next layer of the onion, which will be uh, scalar waves, which is a formulation of how we're getting into our sound waves, our pressure waves, longitudinal waves. But uh, scalar waves are not those at all. But it, they are uh, their own uh, onion and their own layers to get there. Because once you get to a scalar wave, you're dealing with the zero point energy in the middle of the, um, the, the canceling. Once, once the out of polarity, um, or should I say out of phase, because it doesn't matter where it's, no, out of polarity is wrong, out of phase. So basically your out of phase could be any phase, 120, uh, it could be 90, it, it could be, anything in, in the whole spectrum of a circle, uh, a phase. and But the opposite of the phase is what we're talking about with a scalar wave. Because one will cancel the other one out. 
But in the middle of all that happening, you you now broke through the ether, broke through the layer of onion. And, and with that layer of onion there, now you connect it to everything. You're, 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 you, you went above what, what, what we know as norm. In, in physics, you're in, the next, you're in the next layer without a doubt. So here we're not there. Here we're just showing you guys because my sabbatical has been a journey of reading. And one thing I didn't do is is uh, come in my workshop. But what I did do is a lot of reading. And what I got interest, interested in was Tesla a little bit more. And then I reflect back to Edley Scallon, Dr. Kowarski, uh, uh, Shavorsky. I, I, he got into crystals, which has a steady vibration. And it's very important in the whole mist of Tesla and Edley Scallon that the vibration is steady and constant. Just like having a transistor, it's once you put a pulse in into it, it's going to react constantly. There's no change, there's no variation. When you get into these SIG generators, uh, there's no variation. You're controlling it. Now you amplify from those SIG gens and come into something, which is fine. But I, I believe that now I have to bring in old school. And there's my audience because that was where I was my own audience and started with Ed Lee Scallon eight years ago. And basically from that point, here I am, my own audience. I'm still infatuated. I'm still encouraged. These are a bunch of magnets, but it ain't just about the magnets. And you can look at it in so many different ways. And if you look at it in a full circle, you can, you can be any phase. And pretty much, you know, I, I, I thought I knew it all, and I know nothing still. So we're going to work through the whole thing, where it starts, where it, it takes it, like Ed says, Let's go back to a quote of Ed. In magnetic current, Ed says, magnetic currents are made by concentrating, then dividing, then shifting the existing north and south pole individual magnets from one place to another. Explanation point. Plain and simple. That's what we're talking about here. But we're getting into Tesla, which realized that when it cancels each other out, I'm a DJ by heart. When you cancel things out, you create a sound a, a area, you a, a pressure that's n like no other at all. Magnets can go through everything. This shows that each magnet is a small orbit than each particle of light. So what we're saying there is it's all about making a smaller orbit that can punch through everything. And there, there is your scalar waves. Your scalar waves is the one that punches through any rock. That's, Co that's Coquina, that's North Florida uh, coral. And then next to it right there is a little rock there is, um, is at down at least gallon area. So it's regular coral from that area. It's a difference. Coquina is heavier by far. Ed's way lighter. It's ooh light, basically ooh light, meaning light. Coquina, that stuff is super heavy. Anyway, um, stop joking around, Roy. Anyway, um, love you guys. You got your um, back to the thing here. So you got your your scaler, and now we're gonna take this right here, and we're gonna turn the wheel. And I got this hooked up to a voltmeter. So it's going to pick up pressure waves. And not only is it going to pick up pressure waves, it's going to create a, a moving field. So if I charge this PMH, which I didn't, this is just a PMH. If I charge it and had a keeper bar on it and put this magnet and then pulled the keeper bar off, is going to be another video because I'm curious. I have a lot of questions. What happens if I do that? Keep that in mind. Remind me. So now we're gonna to go to the voltmeter. It's running off of here. When we turn the wheel, that's gonna move itself, create pressure waves. Pressure waves gonna pick up here and they're gonna start on the PMH and bounce off each other and then come off with a little amplification into the, now it's only millivolts, it's very little, but we're gonna do another experiment on top of that and kind of see how we can create a wind machine that's not turbine but it's by taking the speaker, the surface area, and having it a constant blow, but a spring back. 
meaning that if it kicks forward as much as it's blown back, it'll create a lot of energy in the inertia between the movement. So let's rock here, leave your comments. I hope you appreciate the video. This is a quick one, 14 minutes. We're gonna get out of here in 20 minutes. So I'm turning the wheel. As I'm turning the wheel, you can see the light start to light up. This right here, you can really not see, but it's vibrating, okay? It's vibrating. And over here on the voltmeter, we have a fluctuation of, of, of electric being generated because the sound waves are penetrating the sound waves. Remember, this is out of phase. Don't have to be aiming towards there, but let's do this. Let's move the voltmeter over and let's go ahead and take the speaker let's put it in a chamber and imagine if we put this in a vacuum chamber they say sound cannot penetrate into a can't work in a vacuum chamber which it can't it needs air but what if we encapsulated this in a vacuum chamber will it create notice how when i space this out we get a high point you can see that jumping high so you need this speaker pushing that speaker to create a pulse, which goes into PMH, which is constantly running, coming into the voltmeter. And you can see that that's slowing down big time. The light is flashing. And we also have a oscilloscope pulse. Now we'll stop it and get a straight line. Oh my God, she's not breathing. Let's bring her back to life. Frankenstein here, let's go ahead. I'm just giddy tonight, guys. Sorry. Um, let's get this having a pulse. We got some amp amplification there. We'll turn it down so the amp is set up different. So you guys can see more of a, a pulse. And the faster I go, the higher the points are. That means the voltage goes up. Here's the light staying constant. There's this. Uh, we're seeing a fluctuation there of, of sound just penetrating from this shooting up there. If we turn this this way, you can see that the voltmeter is gonna have a place to where it's it's humming good. So you'll have volts. The other thing is to, let's do this. This is really cool, that, 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 that thing can turn. It's producing straight up in the air and it's putting electric out on this side. It's constant too there, three, five, seven, there it is. So, so you can see that just the sound waves, the, the how the ether deals with sound with pressure in, in a way that's in sound um that's why i like dr uh Swarsky, i think i'm pronouncing his name right i gotta go back and make sure i'm getting his name right uh Korsky. uh he was in the crystals and he used the longitudinal and also static pressure to create a constant on the crystal which have a constant pressure uh, which would uh, have a constant, uh, which would have a constant frequency, which you can hold true to a number or a place. Time reference. We'll go there. So here you go. So you can see we still got action over here, and that's picking up from the wheel turning. You got your heartbeat. Love it. Cool stuff, right? Let's go ahead and stop this. You can see we flat lines. Nothing's moving there. Nothing's going there. So that was all being done wirelessly through sound in a pressure wave, in a longitudinal wave. Let's go ahead now and do, introduce some air. So we're gonna take this and turn a little bit. We're not turning the wheel. You got no volts going, showing up. Now what if we built a diaphragm? For you guys out there um, that are off the grid and are electronic wise, if you didn't have the turning of the wheel, but you had wind constantly, and if you had a speaker hooked up, and we could, I can design this and draw it out and put it out there. Anybody interested, kind of, you know, touch base with me. Uh, Vinny St. Vincent at AOL.com is my uh, email. You can contact me. I will call. I love people. And I love talking about stuff, regardless of where you're at. Love it, love it, love it. So we can build a diaphragm off of this, and it can be more of a bigger one. And we can have it to where it builds up a certain pressure and then it collapses. So it'll have baffles in it. And then when it back, when it releases, it shoots back and we can have a gauge set up to where we can have so much resistance to where it releases and became, becomes an oscillator. 
in that oscillator, we could say if this was nature and this was a fan of wind, it would blow and all of a sudden now you can see that there's bolts popping up. And all I'm doing now is not turning the wheel, I'm creating a pressure wave by using the fan uh, at a distance and I'm just trying to make an example, an experiment for you guys to pick up on and like how I'm creating electricity. Now, even though it's in small doses, like Ed says, it really, uh, it, it, it only matters when it really does it. You just stack what you're doing and then you collect. You gotta collect. And you can see there just by pressure waves from the fan, happy fan, outside could, you could do something. Do you need the PMH? No, you just need the speaker. Speaker itself without the PMH produces the same thing, but we're gonna do an experiment down the road when you charge the PMH and you have the race car energy running around and it's holding a piece of iron. What happens if you if you put the magnet on there and pull the keeper off? Does the keeper stay to the magnet, which I believe it will, and does it supercharge the race car track? And can, if it was a constant along the coil, the coil would, would not produce any electrons coming from it but if you were to introduce sound pressure into here, you would, you would almost make electronic break on break kind of thing to where it would possibly break or slow down the race car to where it had a difference in potential within itself. Now, I'm just putting this out there. You guys leave your comments. Hopefully you love the sabbatical Roy and um, we're going deeper. We're getting deeper. This is beautiful stuff. You kidding me? Look at this. Starting it from the heartbeat on out to a receiver, coming out in in in, in beautiful sound waves, longitudinal waves, pressure waves, and we're really, really, really getting to the next layer of the onion of the scalar wave, the wave that where Tesla drove his car. He drove his car hooked up to a scalar wave. He was able to go all the way up in New York, way up north, and out of his New York, uh, hundreds of miles away, he was able to have a transmitter going with an understudy over there, running the transmitter, and he was picking it up in scalar waves where he was with no interference, no nothing, and it was a, a, a more like a universal energy where there is no, there is no one source, it's multi-source. So that means when it's yinging, it's yanging twice. It is Edley Scallon saying this. Ring doorbell twice. Leave your comments. Love you all. Stay safe. Peace out. to sit back and listen. Put your feet in the ground, in the sand, the dirt, the water, and listen. Listen to your environment. what life's all about guys things are tough these days times are stressful the things that haven't left us a stay constant are the sounds of nature And hello, my fellow YouTubers. This is Roy back again. And I got a great one for you guys right now. What are we going to do? We're going to listen to Ed's wheel. Let's hear it make a sound. 
And we're going to do that by going through the PMH. And this time I use these Germanian diodes. I set it up as a full wave bridge rectifier. So we're coming in on the two ends of the wire into the um, AC's poles and coming out of the DC poles, we're going into the speaker. So let's get this party started. So we're gonna start off turning the wheel and the speaker is vibrating. No, it's not vibrating. We're going to connect this and listen. amplification with the capacitor. Sound. We can now take Ed's wheel and we can create sounds. They say in some of his writings that they heard a screeching so that what do we have to do to make these screech that means we would have to go down in capacitance because capacitance is pretty unique the capacitance creates a lag in general and when it does that it um, sort of creates punches a hole in a sense, punches a hole only because it creates a time reference. So the lag and the time reference is what the capacitance is in, in depth wise. Is it one farad, half a farad, 500 farads? These guys right here, and these are one nano farad. Everything's in thousands. It's crazy. 1,000 nanofarads is one microfarad. Go a thousand below nanofarad and you have uh, picofarads. So capacitance, if I break this down and go smaller, we we'll get higher pitch. That's what I like about my buddy Tesla. He talks about that higher pitch. Look, still has a little, little juice in there. You heard that in the speaker. Interesting stuff. Because we, you know, listen, I am trying to show you guys how I came about scalar waves and the things that scalar waves can do. Not just going to throw it out there in one shot, but I'm going to say this I'm going to show you how I learned. Through the process of electromagnetic and electrostatic, we're going to bring in 15 videos from now where electrostatics and electromagnetic in a canceling scalar wave will reproduce itself upon itself. It, and when it does that, it takes the object, like an old video I made, um, where I took, um, I came off this pole and I put a wench, this guy right here, and I uh, put boulders on it. And on the bottom side of the wench was the PMH, and what I was just showing was magnetism held up the big boulder. And it's that, um, um, it's that, uh, not woolite, uh, it's, um, <coughs> um, co uh, coquina, very heavy stuff. But anyway, 
probably 10 times heavier than Ed's product down in Coral Castle. That's why they call it uh, Ooh Light. It's real light. But anyway, so um, with that old video I did, I kind of uh, just did it to show magnetism can hold up. And, you know, the coils got hot. You're, you're connecting 12 or 24 volts, whatever it takes to hold up that weight. And, and I was just showing off a little bit about magnetism. Some, a lot of people look at it like it's not levitating. Of course it's not. It's not even floating. But the fact that it's there and I could drop it, bam, and I can't pick it up. I got to get it up, set it, magnetize it, then let it go. Here, with scalar waves, it's the opposite. Whatever it is, piece of metal. I mean, we could take that piece of metal right there today and you just go on YouTube and you can see how they can heat this up with um, electromagnetic induction. You can heat this up, get it hot. Um, you can melt it. So that means you can disintegrate it in parts. Um, so, yeah. But nobody can really take any object and make it bounce up in the air. They can take certain objects and bounce up in the air, but you're dealing with aluminum, you're dealing with iron, you're dealing with electromagnetism, you're dealing with AC waves, and then you're dealing with a DC wave. And this is not about that, but that's all cool ways how we learned as students, all of us, on people, Lathwaite and people like that, doing stuff back in the day, and Tesla, Lathwaite, um, um, Steinmetz, Steinmetz was just crazy. Heavy side, crazy. Things, things these guys... Um, I mean, my brain's dead compared to all the people I can mention, but so with that all being said, back to here, you got the capacitors you can change. So we can change the pitch that's coming out of the speaker by changing the capacitance. And then you can see how we amp it, that we can get something to come out of it. So, um... I guess the next thing would, we would want to learn, which I would like to teach or put out there, is how to talk into that. So basically, if I take another speaker, acts like a microphone, and talk into it, it comes out there. We already did a couple things from the last video, and we talked about the before that, the two videos on scale of waves human body, DNA. Here, we're going to start branching it out now into the, I'm going to call it electric universe. So it's the electric part of everything. We're not dealing with gases, so forth. We're not dealing with um, plasma, so forth. We're not dealing with um, we're not dealing with um, Moisture, that would be the third thing, because uh, we're going through all that and we're dealing with scala. And to get to scala waves, you got to have a balance in between two. It's almost like a figure eight, and in the middle there's a void. In the equator, in the middle of my fingers is the equator. There's a block block wall they call it, or 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 something that allows the poles to kind of turn around and go back at each other in the opposite ways. And it creates uh, what we call the uh, Coriolis effect. And that Coriolis effect sends, you know, it kind of gives it this boom, boom, this way, this way. And when you look at Ed's PMH, it's doing the same thing, but it's getting caught up. You got the keeper bar on. What's, what's really happening? Well, a couple things. One is that the energy is is running wide open through the iron. And secondly is, if you direct it out of the coils, put a load on, just like this, the all of a sudden now it's gonna pull from it at intervals. Now what intervals we're gonna pull from it really matters on the capacitance because uh, I don't really have the setup right here, but on some of my studies I'm doing, is if I had on these two wires a LED in between these wires and an LED between these wires, they both light up. If I add capacitance to one side, this light lights up differently in, in frequency than this light. So that goes ahead and shows all you guys the fact that 
uh, capacitance will go ahead and lag the time frame of the one, the how long does it take to fill this with the energy that's coming in, the induction, all matters. There's a lot going on here. But it goes to show you that when you deal with uh, capacitance or underneath the capacitance, what you have here is is a full wave bridge rectifier. So now we're taking the energy that's flopping. It just in, out, in, out. It's coming from both sides. So both sides of the ends of this um, full wave bridge rectifier is noticing a, a push every other stroke. So every half cycle, every half cycle gets a push. So there's uh, two, two pushes to one. So ring bell twice, Ed says, right? So he was talking about that. So that that matters here how it all of a sudden you get it. You get electromagnetic uh, in, uh, reaction going here. We'll call that uh, transformer action. And then you go touch. Now if I just leave it on there, it's vibrating. You're not going to hear nothing. So to sound, the pressure wave is the fact that it's rotating. So that means you need to take the fluctuation of the um, two poles and the reaction of the transformer action. You need to have another oscillator that goes uh, to the speaker for voice or for whatever you're going to put out of the speaker. So if Ed was to have it make a noise like that, he had to find not only a frequency through sound, but he had to really know the sound to create that frequency through capacitance. Leave your comments. Hopefully you guys enjoy the little tidbits. I'm going to keep working them for you because what I really want to show you, I just can't put out now, but I got to show you in increments so it's out in public of what every step I took in my sabbatical to get, this has got to be 85 to 115 pounds. It's crazy heavy. To get that to just sit up, it takes at least gallon Tesla, Dr. Korsky, it takes crystals. It takes a steady frequency. It takes uh, longitudinal, but really not longitudinal. They're scalar waves, and it also takes a, a, a constant, a constant static. Static is everywhere. Everywhere you look around you is static. That's why sometimes you get shocked by touching something, walking on a carpet, yada yada. It all depends on what pressure you're dealing with in your environment. But at a certain point in your environment, you're gonna it's gonna get colder and the air dries out, less moisture. You're gonna get a static presence. And with that static, if you were to add a scalar wave, you would be able to tap into uh, any object at different frequencies. But any other frequency you're tapping in, and that's what I was just showing you here. It's more about the harmonic of the frequency because they don't go one for one. It could be a 10 to 1 ratio, 21 to ratio, 51 to ratio. It can be whatever ratio because basically phasing is what it's all about. And to be out of phase at the opposite out of phase, you can be at any phase itself and be the opposite of it. So you have to know a full spectrum of where to be researching and where to be knowing where you need to pay attention. So phasing, uh, electrostatics, very important. And the other critical thing is, is with crystals, you can hold a steady frequency. And with uh, steady frequency, once you find the harmonic of the frequency that the product is made from, meaning the uh, atoms, um, the molecular structure of the atoms, whether they're sitting in a figure eight, 
sitting in a six pack, eight pack. And what I mean by that is when you get into atoms, uh, you can see um, what their uh, lattice is about their monocule structure of the atom. And, and when you have, whether it's iron, whether it's plastic, because plastic is really just a couple things together. And then no matter what the material is, that you, once you have a tone, that's what Ed was great at. He had the little sound room and he would he would tone things. Like so if you take this piece of metal, there's a sound. Sound. What does that tell you? Here's hit some magnets. Let's hit a south magnet. Same sound. Let's hit the iron. Let's hit the wood. Everything's got a different sound. Wood with metal. All right. So, let's hit Ed's PMH. Wow. So, if I was a betting man or educational man, like Ed says, that would investigate in something, is when I hit that, there was a frequency that was a vibrating frequency to my ear. Everything else had a dampening sound, a dampening, meaning that it was connected to something else, there was other things going on. It takes a lot more research to find out exactly that tone. But you get here. you got there is a resonating frequency it's a, due to the space that's in between the material itself and how much it's gonna it's still going it's still doing its harmonic thing so that length of not only the time it takes to go in certain distance from one probe to the other that gap but the time it takes to come back so there's your Ed ring bell twice. And uh, that goes to a lot of stuff. Ring bell twice meaning that it is the length of wire. So the distance out, arms reach out, also has to be our arms reach back. And then, then, then you'll have a cycle. Yeah, you can have a half a cycle or a full cycle. And that's your cycle. And you can break that up in quarters, eighths, sixteenths. And you can uh, call each one of those is there's um, the, the whatever the cycle was on that length to go out can be broken down coming back in a sense. So that means that you can have nodes or or or, or um, overtones. And what you can do there is you space out how many times that 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 um, sound wave pressure wave will collapse within itself in the center and then release itself back out and come back into itself. So pretty much you're dealing with a pressure wave from sound, what we just did right there. And then you're dealing with the, the length of the, of the, um, the frequency. And then you're looking at the divisional on how many times you can create overtones or nodes in that and then you can find a harmonic. And that's what I mean back to Ed, what I was talking about here, is that if you're dealing with Schumann or something of, of a element, iron or whatever, you're dealing with items that have a true resonance about themselves. And pretty much from there, you can sort of use sound to kind of get a grip of what the frequency is to tap into that sound. And once you match sound together, you're in the frequency range and you ballpark of what that frequency is. Now, if you can't accomplish that frequency, you can go down in quarters, eighths, sixteenths and, and de develop these nodes, you can call them, or you can call them overtones. And at, at, at this point becomes a cymatic 
It becomes something that is part of a bigger picture that still is in residency of what is going on. So basically, if you walk on a train from a train stop and everybody you look down the train, there's people getting on the train. They're all different places and different times. So not one person at one time walks on that train together without being in a reference difference of where they're standing or a time difference of when they walked in. You guys, leave your comments. Sorry to over talk. Um, didn't want to do that. Uh, pretty much leave your comments. Hopefully you enjoy. Peace out. Hello, my fellow YouTubers. This is Roy back again. This episode is going to start off the one of 15 that's going to get us to levitation using electromagnetic waves, starting with electromagnetic waves. Let's get right to it. Leave your comments. Love your comments. Bring them on. I don't care what you say, how you say it. Bring them on. Let's start off with something. See what you're looking at? Iron pipe so right here it was probably four months ago and I was kind of like talking to Ed and I said to Ed I said why would you have two pipes like that see that pipe so my pipe is always this is the pipe I started with. And I, before I went down the Coral Castle and I um, measured certain things. Well, I went the first time, went the second time. And on the third time I went, I realized I need to measure the pipe. The depth of the pipe, where it stops and the diameter. So I was anxious and I put mine in. When you look at the pictures, it looks like that's it. In reality, this is it. So inside diameter here is more like three. And inside Ed's pipe, outside diameter is two and a quarter, just like one sixteenth over it. And the inside is one and um, uh, almost, almost, I'd say, almost seven eighths but a little less and the question i asked that i said ed oh ed and i talk sometimes i'm straight sometimes i'm not sometimes i'm drinking some beers but i said ed i said what's behind that white stuff in the back and he said to me because i'm covering up the other ground and so is my hand I said, what do you mean by the other ground? See that pipe? See the condenser? He's got two of them on top of that pipe. Then he's got the same thing inside that white panel that's in that corner. He's got a pipe and he's also got two condensers. And why would he do that? What would be the reason? Of course, he's got this bar coming across. That's holding down electromagnetic um, transformer, we'll call it. It would be a smaller PMH like this with copper or iron, probably copper. And it, the iron is that the chains come off of right there. Let's let's get you guys some opticals. What opticals could I find for you? Let me see. We're gonna look inside magnifying glass. See if I can get you in the middle between me and the magnifying glass. Let's look at this picture a little better. 
So if you look at that pipe, that's a glass jar right there. It's a glass jar, and it's actually two. And on top of it, it looks like he has metal bars. You see right there in that top corner, there's, and it comes down. And then it's wrapped with some bailing wire. So maybe he's doing two things here. On the glass jars, he's using iron wire. And that iron wire is bringing along with it some uh, permeability and some lag time, but not much. And then in that back panel over there, he has the same setup. And why would he do that? You can see the box in the front. I call it electromagnetic transformer. But if the positive and negative is crossed in front of a smaller PMH inside that box, and on the back side of that box, you can see that there's a, there's a bolt that runs along horizontally and there's a nut and, a, and a, a, the end of the bolt is a nut. And basically he's got two chains and a wire and the wire comes up, runs across and runs right to that top of that condenser, we're gonna call it. And the, the iron comes, the chains come down and come and wrap around all this stuff, come around and go back to the hook along the top of the handle. All right. So, and there is a, a wire that comes up and runs. You can see it. In fact, you can see it right there. It runs up right there and it goes to that bailing wire. So one thing I learned about chains, which is very interesting, and we're gonna do one of the seminars, 15 seminars from this video on, on how to get to levitation through Edley Scallon. This one seminar, I don't know what number it's gonna be in, but it, it's, it's gonna be in a position on how critical it is because allowing the chains to be present, the chains will per loop, will decide which pole that they are. And what I mean by that is here you got south, north, south, north, south, north, south. And then when I wrap these on, you look back in previous videos, you'll notice I wrap these uh, uh, vertical, no, they have wrapped them clockwise and counterclockwise. Now I can tell you, um, it's been a while, but I'm gonna reflect on my memory is that when I wound the south facing me, I went, count, I went counterclockwise. When I went a north facing me, I went clockwise. I, I'd have to recheck, but um, it's easy to check it because you just wrap 10 turns and then come this way, wrap 10 turns on two pieces of iron. And the front of those irons facing you will have two different poles. If I got them backwards, I'm sorry. But anyway, I don't think I do. <clears throat> anyway, you, you have two different poles. And the chains will pick up that and run with that all the way down through the chains. So when you see chains running through Ed's uh, he's showing off iron up here. He don't need to have this hanging. He don't need to have all this and the bike next to this opening here and wrapped with chains and then the chains coming down and they're heading downward because they're heavy. And then somehow they come back up and, and involve themselves. Now if you look at this chain, you're going to see that um, it's tight. What do I do with that? glass okay if you look at that chain that chain's tense the only time you see chain like that is if you magnetically if you take two ends of a car battery and touch the chain that happens to the chain the chain binds up so you got a binding chain there you got multiple polarities hovering over ed's wheel and then you see the metal hook coming down 
and the hook's got a spark gap right there. So every time that wheel comes around, hits that near that spark gap, that spark gap should ignite. I wouldn't want my hand there. I'm thinking that in this picture, he's turning towards that, then he's gonna let it go. And then when it sparks down and sparks through, it does a strong electromagnetic pulse, which obviously follows through the chain back out, comes back in within itself and allows this, I would think the wheel would turn on its own, but it, it, with having that pipe in the backdrop there of that white, you would be able to create a scale of wave because you would be able to take both of those electromagnetic pulses, which are simultaneously running off the same gear wheel. And if they were in sequence to go off and each one was out of phase from each other, it'd be easy to do with the wheel. So this is exactly the video that we're gonna get into where we take this pole and we move it over to this side and we're gonna take a grounding rod, eight footer, and we're gonna drive it in the ground, drill a hole, eight foot grounding rod, which is iron in the middle and copper on the outside. And then it'll be attached to this pipe, which will be sitting there. You'll see the PMH will follow Ed's uh, specifications. Uh, we'll even could use, uh, well, we'll use these uh, uh, PMHs, but we could use this because this fits and this fits perfectly to this as well. These are just stretched out longer. I, I don't think it really matters. But um, if we were to have two of those and the coils wound appropriately, same length of wire, the same exactly, but when they both went off, they both went off exactly 180 degrees from each other simultaneously. When you come out of both of those, you come into a situation where it's going to cancel itself. Well, the two apparatuses, which would be two more PMHs, or do we send them into capacitors? Condensers back in that day. That's a good question for you guys to leave out because I know what the answer is. But it could be PMHs with iron core striking each other to formulate a figure eight. So if you were to take this one here and this one here and you were to wound these coils to where this one's making this south, this one's north, this one's north, this one's south, and they're both going off. Would be one thing. But if you were to wound this where it's south and this is north, and this is south and this is north, when they both go off, what's going to happen? All of a sudden, this will be out of phase. So when this is south, this is north. When this is north, this is south. And when they're both striked, the bell is rung. And what will happen is in between the space, the chamber that's in between there will be like the uh, bell being struck twice. And what you'll have is a dipole that's prearranged to be a two source dipole. When dipoles are one source of energy and the other side is the opposing side of the strike, which we're talking about scalar waves here in nature. We're talking at the scala now to where we would have south naturally, south naturally, but if they're both being struck at the same time, the opposing field shows up here of this field and the chamber in between 
becomes activated with a scalar wave. The scalar wave is picking energy from both sides and also on this side. So now you have a quad scalar wave. It's a quad, you're actually pulling energy from four sources versus one. Here you're pulling from one source because if this is positive, this is negative, and this is negative, and this is positive. You're pulling from two sources. But when you have a chamber in the middle and your pickups are crystals, which we're gonna get into, which will take that vibration and control it into a certain frequency. And when you come out of that certain, certain frequency, it brings us into another video and we'll talk about that. But this is how you der derive from, from having the question answered by Mr. Ed Leeds Callan through me is that you need two grounds. So you need a ground here and then you need a ground there. And simultaneously, when one is going off, the other is going off. And they are doing that through the source of one pulling energy from each, from their individual connection to ground. And two is we'll show the black box's importance where it has on top here a black box. Well, a box. And it's not, that's, it does a couple fold. One, it protects the top of the timbers and you put creosol on the top and you put the box on top and you make it goopy and the box won't come off. It just keeps the average rain, which is acid rain off of it. The second thing is you can see coming down, he had bought from the railroad, Flagler Railroad, when it went out of business, it sold its uh, uh, railroad tracks to the state of Florida. He picked up the hoist. He took that, he, a couple of them. So that hoist you see that's sitting right there is hanging from there. And he's also got another thing hanging from there. Um, he's got not only the chains, which you have your basic weights and measures, but he also has cables coming down. And these cables do come out on the sides. And he has a hole drilled down about eight inches down on either side. And he's got metal pegs into the oolite coral rock but the cables do stretch out on both sides and you can see that it's all lynched up to the top and he's obviously got bolts going through the top holding all this which is a lot of weight he's lifted up a lot of stuff and there it is so when that appeared he was all done with this he was done done building and he moved on to his his uh, studies here but he did have a couple of them, so who knows? But I'm pretty sure when uh, uh, Mr. Can, Can book, that that one shows that he had a few of them. And um, the other thing I want you to notice in this picture is that back whiteboard the first pipe, you can see the bailing wires on the pipe. So he's showing that the iron is very important. And the reason that is, is that, uh, you know, everything in the, in the ground is in pockets. So if you think about the dirt and earth, the soil, which is more growing soil than anything, of pockets of anything, even though some stuff comes to the rips its head to the surface, but it's really in pockets of the world. But in majority, everybody has uh, growing soil, sand. So it eliminates the area from having the uh, metals it needs, but it does have powdered uh, aluminum. And that's how they get aluminum. Aluminum is, is the majority um, uh, metal uh, in the whole world, uh, more than iron the abundant and it's in powder form. There's no pockets like iron that you would get or iron ore that's attached to rock or or, uh, 
or copper ores or silver ores or gold ores. Uh, you're, you're looking at aluminum, which obviously is must be a, a meteorite that approached our Earth, smashed itself, and spread itself out through the whole surface because they're finding it, I don't know, 80 feet deep, I believe, around the whole entire planet. So aluminum. So that would make our surface of our aluminum our, 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 of our planet, whether it's got water on it or rock or boulders or whatever, that it's very, um, very uh, reactive to a magnetic field in an electric way. So it's almost you're 90 degrees off from from electric to magnetism. So when you get a magnetism field, which when we take a compass, we can hold the compass up in our hand. If you hold the compass vertically, it ain't doing nothing. If you hold it horizontally, it does something. So that goes to show you that the waves are traveling across the surface of the earth. And, and, and at least in the compass wise, it's not so much traveling vertically, horizontally. So with that being said, uh, leave your comments, that it is um, moving across and uh, it uh, 90 degrees from that would be your uh, electric. And if you look how lightning strikes, oh my Lord, it happens to be 90 degrees off the, uh, the bend. So if you look at that L, finger going straight up, thumb going straight out, there goes, this right here is your electric, this here is your, electro your electromagnetism. Because a compass will only read this way, not vertically. So by nature shows you uh, the direction and the flow. I also um, would like to bring to your attention that the next 15 episodes or videos that I'm gonna post to get to levitation, meaning floating a rock, iron, copper, gold, anything that is of substance that we can put in our hand, plastics, uh, through electromagnetic uh, uh, induction, will show you guys that Ed Lee Scallon did levitate the rocks. That he realized from his first location, because he had the same setup, that he went from small rocks to bigger, build bigger rocks he did have the wheel at the first location because that's where he filed his patent. And when he refused to give up to the two patent agents there, um, uh, the machine, when they came to visit, two days later, thugs came and robbed him and beat him nearly to death. But they couldn't get apart the wheel or anything, but they came and beat him to death, almost to death. He recovered from that, again, the second time of recovery for Edley Scallon, thank God to the people who were looking out after him when he had tuberculosis, coming from the, the range of uh, Washington, where the big, the big sequoias are, beautiful state of Washington. Um, he uh, had to deal with coming back to life again, in a sense, where he was beat up brutally. And at that point, the realtors who who sold him that property or gave him that original first property, we had uh, Rockgate, where he had smaller boulders on the whole outside perimeter wall and he was dealing with the, the still doing carvings and stuff. But he did know about and did put a patent back there um, at the first location. So it goes to show you that um, he was able to, based on some of the storyline or affidavits to where he was able to have the flatbed truck be pulled up Guy leaves for an hour, comes back, it's loaded, and there's no equipment. So how was that all done? So he's not moving those big tripods around. He supposedly, in affidavit, had uh, two cones. And the cones were shaped like these cones. And he put the cones up, and they were screeching and howling. And up to the, the boulder, and the boulder lifted up, and he moved the cones over. And where we moved the cones, the oolite, or the coral rock, you can call it, had moved along with it, and he was able to move stuff that way. Interesting concept. Never really thought he did it. Um, now I know that it is true. And 15 videos are going to get you guys to the end. 
and then you'll be able to build it yourself. You use electromagnetism uh, to create a longitudinal wave. At that point, you're going to create a scalar wave. And I'm going to teach you how to build antennas and cones to allow a certain frequency. And the key thing here is um, the frequency of anything is particular. That's why uh, crystals with Dr. Korsky back in, uh, in, eight, in 19, um, 1917, 1918, he uh, was working on uh, a constant frequency through using crystals. And he found a lot of other stuff that came along with it. So obviously Ed did too. And this is where all this um, raw stuff comes in because it shows you how you got there. And you're able to use the crystals because the crystals levitated themselves. And not only do the crystal levitate, but they also increase their size 20 fold over. So if you were able to take any object and use a constant frequency to it and allow a scale wave to be trapped within that element or elements, you're able to manipulate it to not melt like how we uh, use induction heating to melt iron or so forth, uh, copper or whatever. But it, it's, it's a frequency different out of phase, I would almost say, of destroying something. Now it just, it, it makes it weightless. I want you guys to leave your comments. Peace out. Love you all. Stay safe. Don't get political. Just fight for your right. Love you all. Peace out.